Today we're going to talk about Dalton's Law, Graham's Law, Kinetic Theory, Molecular Theory, and Non-Ideal Gases. This will wrap up our gas unit. We, um, you should have a set of notes, and they have a t t title, Dalton's, Graham's, Kinetic Molecular Theory, and Non-Ideal Gases. The first thing we're going to talk about are most gases are mixtures. The air, of course, is 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and then the rest is bits and pieces of argon, carbon dioxide, neon, helium, so on and so forth. Um, in certain applications, the mixture can be thought of as one gas. Um, even though the air is a pressure, we can measure the pressure, volume, and temperature of air as if it were a pure substance, and we can calculate the total of moles if we know pressure, volume, and temperature, even though there's different molecules in there. All right. Now, the law of pressures, Dalton's law of partial pressures, is that all the pressures of each individual gas add up to be the total pressure of the gas. For instance, if we go back here to this air, 78% of the pressure of air is from nitrogen. So if we know we have a t air pressure of 1.5 atmospheres, 78% of that one point five times point seven eight is one point nine two. I divided I didn't multiply. Is one point one seven. All right, so that's the part of pressure of that one and a half pressure atmosphere reading that is due to the nitrogen. And then we could do the same thing, multiply 1.5 times 21%, and we would get what the oxygen would, what was due from the oxygen. So basically, if you have a uh, situation where you have different pressures, they were going to all add up to the total pressure. Now, this comes into play for the lab that we are going to do on Monday the 1st. We are going to be collecting gas, and a gas, if it is collected over water, because water evaporates very easily, when you collect a gas over water, you also are collecting some water vapor. That water vapor amount is dependent on the temperature of the room. So one of the things we're going to have to do is take the temperature of the room and figure out the partial pressure inside the uh, tube that we're working with of the water. Okay, We do that using a water table, or vapor pressure table. Here we have temperatures in Celsius, and we have pressures in millimeters of mercury. All right, we could have it in inches of mercury, we could have it in atmospheres, just this is the one that the book provided, and this matches up to the one we're going to use with our lab. Here's what we're talking about. If you are collecting a gas over water, so you've got a container that you've filled completely with water, if you start to bubble the, wa the gas in, it will displace the water, just like Archimedes figured out that if you put something solid into water, it will displace the water equal to the volume of the substance. Well, the same thing happens with the gas. But notice what's coming into this tube, and we won't have a tube, we'll just have the reaction occurring right there in the water, though we have just one kind of gas, and inside here we have that same gas, which is hydrogen, and water molecules. Here we see water molecules, and we see the hydrogen gas going up, but in the top part where we collect the gas, we have uh, both water molecules and uh, hydrogen molecules. So if the total pressure of the gas is 758.2, and you would find that by checking the barome barometric pressure currently, and we'll have something we can use in class for that. If the total pressure is 758, and we look on our chart, and it tells us that the water vapor pressure at 25 is 23.78, we just simply take 758.2 minus 23.78, and then 
our remaining gas should be 734.4 millimeters of mercury. So, Dalton's Law of Partial Pressures, pretty simple. You just add up all the pressures. And you've got a couple questions on a uh, homework about that. Kinetic molecular theory is the explanation of why gases do the things they do. That theory says that the gas is a collection of particles, molecules, or atoms that are in constant motion. When we talk about kinetic molecular theory, we have to remember that the size of gas molecules is very small. So when we're talking about kinetic molecular theory, we don't worry about the size. We just assume that it's nothing. The average kinetic energy is the same as the temperature. The, num the, the kinetic energy that the particles have moving around is the same as the temperature of the mixture. Um, if one particle collides with another, it's a completely elastic collision, meaning they bounce off each other, they don't stick together, they transfer their energy from one to the other. The particles of the gas are constantly moving. The attraction between the particles, because they're so far apart, is negligible. They don't attract each other. Um, they, they, when they bounce off each other, they don't stick, but bounce off. That's the elasticity again. And we have a lot of empty space between our particles. Okay? Now, the kin average kinetic energy, we just talked about this. If you raise the temperature of a gas, the speed of the particles increases. But not all the particles move at the same speed. So the average kinetic energy of a gas is going to be the same um, of two gases, if they're at the same temperature, they're going to have the same average kinetic energy. They may not be moving the same speed, but they will have the same average kinetic energy because kinetic energy is calculated by taking one-half times the mass times the velocity squared. So basically, when we talk about kinetic molecular th th energy, um, we're talking about speed of the particles, how fast they're moving. Okay? They exchange energy, but they don't lose energy. Okay, and here's a picture of an elastic collision and an inelastic collision. All right, so which sample of an ideal gas has the greatest pressure? Let's look at these. Here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven particles in that box. This box has seven particles. This box has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Now, what do you know about pressure and volume? First of all, volume, uh, I'm sorry, pressure is the number, the uh, force that each of these is hitting the side of the box with. So who has the most force of these three? Does it matter that this guy's bigger than this guy? No, but they have the same number of particles, so they're going to have the same pressure. This guy has more particles, so he is exerting more pressure on the sides of his container. Okay, so the sample of gas that has the greatest pressure is this guy because he has more particles in there. These guys have equal number of particles, and while their mass isn't the same, they're still going to hit the sides of the wall with the same pressure. Pressure is force divided by area. All right. So, now that we have a little bit better of an understanding of the kinetic molecular theory, let's talk about temperature and molecular velocities. Average energy depends on the average mass and velocity. Gases in the same container have the same temperature, so they have the same kinetic energy. But, if you have two gases in the same container that have different masses, one is going to move differently than the other. Let's look back at this picture again. Here, let's assume this is one container. If they are all moving at the same speed because they have the same temperature, one of these particles is moving faster than the other because the mass is different. All right. Why is that important? Well, we're, now we're going to talk about diffusion and effusion. Diffusion is the old 
thing that occurs when uh, somebody farts and you can see it move across the room because you see people's reaction to it. Um, diffusion or if somebody sprays perfume. Diffusion occurs, let's give it some particles, when gases mix together. Okay, and we've got uh, 40 of each, the blue and the red, and you can see that they're spreading together and they mix themselves basically. We've got would appear to be more reds on the right, but that's what diffusion is. Now, effusion is different. Effusion, where did it go? Here it is. Effusion is um, the process by which molecules escape through a small hole. So diffusion is just when they spread out. Effusion is when they escape through a small hole. This is why balloons deflate over time, because the balloon has gas in it, and there's tiny holes in the gas, and over time, the balloon will deflate. All right, so here we have an example. I have 100 particles of both a heavy gas and a light gas in here. I'm going to open this container, and they're going to start to escape. Okay, we just had one of each escape. And I'm just going to let this go for a minute, and we'll come back. Notice where it's 97 on the heavy, 92 on the light. We started at 100, so we've already lost more light ones than we've lost heavy ones. We'll come back to it and check it in a minute. But a fusion is determined by the mass of the particle. The larger the mass, the fast, the higher the effusion rate. All right. The higher, the larger the mass, the higher the effusion rate is concerned. All right. Here's another drawing of effusion. Now, we can calculate that rate if we know the molecular mass, all right? And we know masses because we can use a periodic table, okay? So now I want you to, well, we'll put this to uh, work in a moment. Let's go back and check our experiment that's going on. So we've lost three of the heavy ones, and we've lost 15 of the light ones. So hopefully this helps support that idea that the heavier ones uh, a fuse at a slower rate than the lighter ones. Okay? All right. So here's a question. A glass tube contains an equal number of moles of helium and argon. After five minutes, half the particles escape through a small hole in the glass. What are the relative amounts of helium and argon in the tube at five minutes? All right, so we have a tube, and we have helium, and we have argon, okay? And we have a small hole, so they're escaping, that they can get out, all right? Who's going to escape, who, which gas will have more escapees, the helium or the argon? To answer that, we need to look at our periodic table. Which I know I have on here somewhere. Well, I know I have it in honors because I just moved it over there. So if we look at helium and argon, helium has a mass of 4, argon has a mass of 40, okay? So back to this question, they've got equal numbers of particles, but helium has a mass of 40. I'm sorry, 
Argon has a mass of 40, and helium has a mass of 4. Now, if we look back at this equation, we can figure out the rate of the helium compared to the argon if we plug numbers in. All right, so M stands for the molar mass. The molar mass of the argon was 40. The molar mass of the helium is 4. 40 divided by 4 is 10, so we need to take the square root of 10. Do I have square root on here? We get 3.16. That means that the helium is escaping 3.16 times faster than the argon. All right, let's look at the problem. So who has, which one, if the helium's escaping faster, who's going to have more particles in the container, the argon or the helium? Well, the tube should contain more argon because the helium's smaller, so it's going to escape faster. Okay, real gases. Real gases, so far everything we've talked about are ideal gases. And remember, we just got done talking about the kinetic molecular theory. Gases are far apart. They don't come in contact with each other. When they do come in contact, it's elastic. They bounce right off. They don't affect each other. And that works for gases until you get to high pressure or low temperature. If we have a high pressure of gases, so we have a lot of gases in there, and they're moving around. All right, I should put arrows in there. At a high pressure, they're going to be closer together. Because if you want to increase pressure, you can decrease volume. That's one way to increase pressure. So at high pressure, they're going to be closer together. When they're closer together, while particles don't exert in a gas, don't exert an effect on each other, when they're close together, they do affect each other. So high pressure, you're going to have particles attracted to each other. So particles may be stickier. Um, it'll affect the gas. The other example is low temperature. If I have a gas at low temperature, my gas particles stop moving as fast. They're still moving, but instead of having big arrows, they have small arrows. Now, think about volume and pressure. If we cool, I mean volume and temperature, if we cool the temperature down, the volume goes down as well, right? So if the volume goes down, the temperature goes down, those particles are going to be closer to each other once again. And then they'll affect each other. So real gases don't hold up if you get to high temperature or low pressure because you no longer have that vast amount of space between them. They're close to each other. They can affect each other. And we haven't talked about intermolecular forces, which usually we've done by now, but they affect each other with something called intermolecular forces. Okay, here's a picture as we made the volume smaller, the particles are closer together, and they're now going to affect each other. Okay, low temperatures, pressures of gases are less than an ideal gas. At low temperature, gas atoms spend more time interacting with each other because they're closer, and the, so the pressure is less than ideal. So low temperature their particles affect each other. So we will have lower pressures than normal. All right, at high temperature, the pressure effect isn't much changed. All right, so now please get out the packet that looks like
this. It started out on the first said gas pressure. And then you guys watched the video and worked the Boyle's Law, Charles Law, Gay-Lussac's Law, Avogadro's Law, and Ideal Gas Law problems along with me. So now we're going to look at the part that talks about effusion, Graham's Law, Dalton's Law, and non-ideal gases. And we have some problems to work together here. All right, the first one is effusion. Remember that effusion, the smaller the gas, the faster it'll um, effuse. So what we want to do is figure out how many times faster hydrogen will effuse compared to carbon dioxide. What do we need to know for that? We need to know the molar masses. Carbon dioxide, you've got uh, 16 times 2 is 32 CO2, and then 12 from the carbon. So you have a molar mass of 44 grams per mole for CO2. Hydrogen has a molar mass of 2.016 because remember hydrogen is a Hofbrinkel, so it will be in a pair. So the first thing we're going to do is divide 44 by 2. And we get 21.8. Now we need to take the square root of that. And we get 2.3. If I did it right. That doesn't make sense, does it? Fourteen point seven. I hit it equal twice, and that's what the problem was. So what that tells us is the rate of hydrogen will be fourteen point seven times faster than CO two. Okay. Let's try the next. All right. So now. Sorry about that. Now we know that rate 1, we're going to solve for rate 1, we know that rate 1 effuses at a rate of 14.7 times higher than rate 2, and rate 2 is 32. So how do I solve for rate 1? Well, I divide both sides by 14.7. Two point one seven. So the rate of the hydrogen should be two point one seven. Okay. Number three. What is the relative rate of diffusion of NH three compared to helium? All right. Once again, we're going to do NH three compared to helium. So we're going to look at the rate of helium divided by the rate of NH3, and that's going to be equal to the mass. We're going to say 17 for helium, ammonia, NH3, ammonia, and 4 for helium, and we're going to get the square root of that. 17 divided by 4, and the square root of that is 2.06. So, Helium is 2.06 times faster than NH3. So if helium takes 30 seconds or 20 seconds to effuse, how long will the NH3 take? So we'll take 20 seconds times 2.06. And 
we get 41.2 seconds for the NH3. Okay. The biggest thing to take away from this is this statement here. Smaller mass will effuse faster. All right, Dalton's law, all the particle pressure par, all the partial pressures add up to the whole. So here we're given the total pressure is 99.99 atm and it tells us that the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is 0 0.05 atm and the partial pressure of hydrogen sulfide is 0 0.02 atm so the remaining air is what well Point nine nine minus point zero five minus point zero two. The remainder of the air is point nine two atm. Okay. What's the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in a container that holds five moles of carbon dioxide? Three moles of nitrogen and one mole of hydrogen and has a total pressure of 1.05. All right, so the pressures add up to the whole, right? What we have here, we know the, the amounts. We know that of this 5 eighths of the carbon di of the pressure in the container comes from carbon dioxide. 3 eighths comes from nitrogen and 1 eighth, oh, I can't do the math. How about we try this again? 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. 5 ninths, 3 ninths, and 1 ninth. So to find the pressure of just the carbon dioxide, we're going to take 1.05 times 5 ninths. And we get 0.58. Okay. The last one, a container with two gases is 30% by volume helium. Calculate the partial pressure of helium in an argon, argon if the total is 4. So the total pressure is 4 8 atmospheres. The pressure of the helium is 30% of that, so the pressure of the argon is going to be 70% of that. So for the pressure of helium, we'll take 4 times 0 0.30, 1.2, 1 and for the pressure of the argon, we'll take 4 times 0 0.70, And we get 2.8, add those up, and you get 4. All right, then the last bit, there's no problems with that. It's just more information about non-ideal gases. All right, thank you very much.